Here it comes. Yep. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brews and Bites. Uh, before we begin, a little housekeeping. Uh, we do have some attachments, some downloads, and some great links for you to click through to find out more information about uh, today's speakers and also about uh, this overall, this general topic that we're here to discuss. And uh, we are talking about video production and broadcasting in this new social distancing era. You know, what's here to stay? I think everyone has had some form of change uh, within their daily workflows and their daily work life and their personal life. And uh, you know, what, what's here to stay? And with me, I have two great uh, speakers, uh, good friends of mine both. Uh, we have Ben Cantor. VP of Global Sales for Coringo, and also Nick Smith, VP of Technology for JBNA. So maybe introduce yourself, Nick, first, and then we'll go to you, Ben. Sure. Well, I mean, you hit it. Uh, I'm Nick Smith. I'm the VP of Technology for JBNA. We're a partner distributor of your guys's. So um, you know, on the technology side, that's where we sit. Uh, more specifically, I'm I'm just a nerd. I love technology. I love how it works, where it doesn't work, how to make it work better. And and kind of like my goal in life is to figure out where things fit and where they don't. And, and you know, it, that's that's the part of the technology side that I just dig the most. And what does JBNA focus on from a general? I think so, so, so our viewers can get a yeah. No, we're, of, we're kind of we're kind of an odd duck in that regard. So we have our business model split between pro AV technology, so conference and boardrooms, communication tools, all the way into the post and broadcast arena. So where does your content go? How do you manage it? How do you get it into whatever that management platform is? Where are you storing it? How are you transcoding it? So we kind of holistically want to look at the entire pipeline of media from the creation to the distribution side of it, and so all of our technology partners kind of fit within that mold of being able to deliver uh, seamless end-to-end -end solutions. Okay, and Ben, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, uh, as you said, I'm the sales leader for the Kringo team here. Uh, it includes sales and pre-sales engineers and been with the company five years, just actually across the five year mark. Um, and I can say that this working from home really hasn't changed much, except that there's more people in my house now <laughs> when we're doing it than ever before. So that's the biggest adjustment there. But uh, yeah, my background, I came from the VAR side of the business. So I've always been customer focused and, you know, using technology to help customers. You know, that's really what it's about is customers have pains and problems. And I love to help people and using technology to do it has always been a passion of mine. Yeah, and you're—I mean—you're going to come at this from the infrastructure perspective, where I think Nick's coming at this topic from, you know, everything from the front front end all the way down to the infrastructure. So I think it'll be a really good discussion. Uh, but before we begin, this is brews and bites, right? So we have to show and share our brew. So uh, why don't you go first, Nick, since since you're the guest? Mine's mine's uh, an americano today. It's been one of those mornings. So <laughs> at at what are we? Eleven o'clock. I'm on my giant americano. Uh, <laughs> How about you, Ben? What, what do you drink? Uh, What's your brew? And so this is a uh, quad shot espresso, um, my second one of the day. So. Yep. Nice. Thank you. Well, I, I'm not drinking yet. I have my LaCroix, my, my sparkling water. But if I was drinking, I would be drinking this Stone Fear Movie Lions uh, Double Hazy IPA. It's great, very delicious, and it works. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you it works. And uh, fear movie <laughs> yeah. live. So, so here we go. He has the Corona. Oh, there you go. I got my, I got the Corona prepped and yeah. ready to go. Uh, well, Corona. Yeah, there we go. So Corona, coronavirus movie, video production of broadcast. It's a great segue into what we're about to talk about, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, three months ago it was a different world, right? Yeah. From, from from a broadcast and video production perspective, Nick. You know, why don't you walk us through? what's changed like what are you saying and, and have have things changed from from the beginning of the pandemic to now they they have um what's weird is in the first couple of weeks it was uh we just need a temporary solution now people are like well we might need a permanent solution and, and i think the mindsets are shifting not just at the um, the the daily user level, right? The editor and the producer and the people that are at the, the ground level getting things done. But at the management level as well, we're starting to hear from people going, okay, well, 
this kind of works. So how do we put some of these tools in place that are on a more permanent basis so that A, we're prepped for the next one, or uh, B, we can continue to be have this sort of flexible, nebulous production environment that utilizes both on-prem tools and at home tools, right? Um, and so that's that's been the the shift. I mean, the, the first couple of weeks was um, every church in the world calling saying, I gotta be online tomorrow. What can I do for as cheap as possible, right? And then we started to see more of the production companies come out of the woodwork and studios come out of the woodwork, start asking these questions of, well, how can I make my production better? I'm online now, right? I'm streaming. So now how do I make the quality better? How do I um, you know, invest in the proper tools now? Because we did it first with Zoom now we want to do it with something better and so the the quality of the content they want to produce is changing and then the the budgets that they're putting towards this are opening up because initially it was cheap now it's well we got to do this you know more efficiently and that's going to require us to spend a little capital to get it done yeah i guess here you're talking about an acceptance that this may go well into the the, the future and it, you know you're talking about things possibly becoming permanent right from, a, from an overall workflow perspective, or do you think you know stuff is gonna kind of go back to the way it was? Well, I think things are gonna go back to the way it was right out of the gate because people are dying to get back into offices and out of their homes. I mean, we all commented individually yesterday and today, like the exhaustion of having a lot of people in a house where it's normally much quieter and having you know the ability to work in a quiet space and you know take lunch when you want to take lunch and now i'm like my house we're tripping over three kids 10 13 and three all in very different places all doing homework at different speeds some not at all right and so it there's no there's no great uh, i guess just like schedule so it's hard to to work from home for a lot of people me specifically i'm here at the office Shh. Um, but because of that, I think we're going to see people like immediately jump back into the communal experience, the the value of of knocking on your neighbor's cubicle going, what do you think of this? Check out this video, right? And getting the immediate response versus texting it to somebody and waiting and waiting and waiting for them to respond. You know, was it funny or not? So yeah, I think we're going to see people jump in. But on the flip side, I think companies that had non-remote work policies in the past are now reevaluating that as they realize the cost of maintaining a large building, the cost of supporting the infrastructure to support 500, 1,000, however many people, right? And if they can offload some of that cost to people in their home offices, that also changes where you can get talent from. If my talent pool is only LA, but there's a great editor in Texas, and we've now workshopped this ability to do remote production, why wouldn't I take advantage of that amazing editor, right? That doesn't want to yeah. live in LA. And yeah. that's going to open up the door more and more because we've now softened the idea of remote work uh, and, and it's acceptable now where it may not have been before. Yeah. And Ben, how about you? you know, from, from the infrastructure side, from what you've seen out there, we're talking about remote, remote workflows. I think you have a lot of experience there being a part of a virtual company and also <laughs> talking yeah. to a lot of organizations that are trying to set this stuff up. So what are you saying? Yeah. It, I mean, we come from a unique perspective. Coringo has been a distributed organization um, from day one that I've been with a company, if you think about it, um, we're really almost in the four corners of the country from an executive team perspective. I mean, we have our CEO in, in uh, San Francisco. We have you, Adrian, down in San Diego. I'm up in Boston. Um, and we're still used to collaborating remotely. I mean, what we get together daily um, and weekly, and we're able to share things. And um, being able to have a, a platform to collaborate and share things and execute in and keeping it simple that any user internal or external can access has been you know it's what we do it's what we deliver as an infrastructure so being able to eat our own cake has made a big difference and i, I would say what companies are looking for now more than ever is being able to manage systems from a remote location uh the infrastructure Things are going to fail. Hard drives fail. Hardware does break down over time. That's why you replace it. But being able to have a system that's still up and running while you're not there and present has been more of a requirement than ever. And I can say for POCs that are going on with some of our customers today is there's more focus on that remote management, that remote um, administration um, alerting than there's ever been before. Be before it was nice to have where customers would be, hey, I can replace it. I'm here versus now 
can I know about it from sitting in my house 30 miles away from a data center or okay. being remotely? Yeah, and, and maybe, I mean, you, you touched upon a few elements of the cloud, right? So I think, I think when users kind of exit this period, they're gonna have two options, or even during this period, they're gonna have two options. They're gonna evaluate a lot of cloud solutions, and they're gonna evaluate a lot of on-prem solutions. So, you know, Nick, maybe maybe walk us through what you are seeing from the end user perspective. Like, what, how, how are they considering these technologies? What are they doing? What are they looking at? And what are you seeing? Yeah, I guess, you know, I guess when we come to like a production pipeline, like the actual yeah. process of manipulating and editing the data to present a new video, it's it's being attached to the media, right? Having that on your laptop or, or can, on a drive connected to your laptop has always been supreme. That's the fastest, most efficient way to edit. And when my storage is across town and I can't access it the same way over fiber channel or 10 gig or 40 gig or whatever I'm using, it changes the process. So we're seeing people kind of look at a couple different technologies. Do I bring my content to me? and have it on a local drive, a local NVMe or, or hard drive direct attached to my computer, or am I remoting to my content, right? To where my um, my my primary storage is. So are we setting up, you know, VMs and, and remote KVM machines that we can log into on premise where we're using the same system we always edit on. I'm just have a little bit of latency because I'm going through team viewer or something like that. Or am I waiting on the content to be delivered to me and in located on a local hard drive where I can edit there. And then you've got the third one, which is there are some new technologies like, you know, I guess they're not new. I mean, there's the guys like Bebop and some of the others that are saying, okay, well, we're going to virtualize your file system into the cloud. We're going to give you a virtual machine in the cloud that's got all the horsepower of the one on-prem and you're going to remotely edit utilizing an AWS server, right? But the expense of that sometimes is more than people are willing to bear right now. Like all three of these have pros and cons, one with latency, one with delivery times, one with, you know, higher costs than we would pay normally. So it's, it you know, I think people are testing the waters of all of these, trying to come up with good workflows. I had a chat with a sports team earlier this week that was saying, look, we have all this data coming in. It goes to our central storage. People can access it, but I need to be able to get to it, to log it, to tag it, to manipulate it, to put, you know, metadata around it so that we can, you know, understand it. That requires me downloading it, right? And so he's got this shuttle issue of moving data back and forth between consumer internet and storage to pro internet and storage, right? Or, or enterprise internet and storage. So these are, these are the workflows that people are stumbling through right now going, what is the best way, you know, or, or how am I going to achieve this in a cost efficient? And again, they're at a, I think a crossroad right now with, I'm not necessarily wanting to put in a tool that's a permanent, you know, or, or sign on for something or buy a technology that is a long-term technology when they don't know if this is gonna last three months, a year, or this is the, our future. Yeah. And what do you see, Ben, from, from a cloud and on-prem perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, the customers I'm talking to are looking at it differently. Um, the, the forward-thinking ones are looking at the new content or content creation gap that's going to be um, because where they can't create anything new in a lot of cases right now because of the lockdown, you know, people can't be on set, they can't be playing pro sports, whatever have you. So there's a gap uh, happening. So they're thinking, how can we monetize our archive? And they're realizing if it's on tape or if it's uh, in Glacier or certain uh, traditional approaches, it really limits their ability to access and monetize and, and use that content. So when we're talking to customers, they're looking for a lot of times an infrastructure that will be flexible enough to help them with what they need today, but also to be able to adapt to when things are, are over. Uh, can we adjust it there as well? You know, the elastic type of environments that can scale up and down based on the current environments. You know, can it be um, just a cold archive, a warm archive? Can it be a near line? You know, all in one is, is a very common request. And I, I think it's, that's the forward looking. I mean, for the ones, you know, the most of the companies we're dealing with or, or I've dealt with recently has been the first, and I think we're getting through that is, okay, how do we keep people online, how do we get remote workers up and running? I think we're past that. Now there's time to look at that infrastructure, both in, as Nick mentioned, the, the highway or the network to transport things, but also where are they getting that data from? What is the source and what's the destination? And that's that's where Gringo comes in. And I, and I think yeah. you bring up a really interesting piece of that right there, which is there's this conversation that I think, and it's around miseducation, that the cloud is only something you buy 
um, you know, in, in somebody else's data center. And, and that's the one that I think I, I'm struggling and getting people to understand the message. The cloud is not something that's only delivered by Amazon, by Rackspace, by Microsoft, by Google, right? There's, you know, when these people are looking at, you know, okay, I've got to take all this content I have and make it available to my editors, to my content producers, to my third party vendors, they're thinking, well, I have to vault it to one of those. And there's time in that process of getting the content up there. This doesn't happen instantaneously, right? Especially when you're talking, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data. So this process of getting it to the cloud, and if cloud is not going to be your, you know, your baseline for the future, you know, you're only talking about a temporary process. So you're gonna pay egress fees and ingress fees for something that goes up there for a couple of months, maybe. Alternatively, we, what we have to really look at is why am I not my own cloud provider? And this is what I've always appreciated about what you guys are bringing to the table is the ability to be your own cloud, right? You've already got the content sitting right there with the, you know, the mod of, you know, a small amount of hardware, you can very quickly set up your own cloud environment, deliver the same experience, but not have to deal with the data transfer fees, the latencies, all those pieces of saying, well, I'm waiting on Amazon, right? Or I'm I'm, I'm paying the Amazon, which, oh, I didn't pay the fast enough Amazon's version, right? And then, you know, so it's that. So the ability to kind of be your own cloud provider is where I think people really need to readdress what they're achieving right now, because that could be set up far faster. Your data could be transferred far faster. You have much greater level of control over it by being your own service provider. And you can start to tie other applications to it as well, right? Oh. About your primary storage, your secondary storage, your play out servers. So it just, it opens up a wholly different production environment when you say, I wanna be my own cloud versus yeah. I'm gonna go pay somebody else to be my cloud. Yeah, and it's interesting to see the, the production companies and the broadcasters and the content organizations that were already set up to be clouds, right? And you saw how quickly they pivoted. You saw how quickly Disney released movies you know, for purchase instead of releasing them in the theaters. Yep. You see, you saw how quickly, you know, WWE and UFC came out. I mean, what, what else are you seeing out there? I mean, I think you guys are both content consumers, right? What what are you seeing from the organizations that have been able to pivot quickly, who, who have been innovative in the space? Well, I guess I'll jump in here. I was thinking of what I watched the other night, uh, a local sports channel. They rebroadcasted the 2011 Stanley Cup Game 7 with the Bruins. And they had approximately 15 of the players from that team on live on a Zoom uh, while the game was going on. And you're watching them and they're reacting to what's happening in the game real time. So they're using old content, but adding a new spin to it. And this has been, uh, and Nick, when we talked the other day, you refer this yep. to almost like the director's cut for DVDs. Yeah. Uh, in a sports world, it's not common that you see that. That So this they're adding this commentary um, from a perspective that you've never seen before. So even though I knew the outcome, which was a great Bruins victory, um, and I knew most of the plays and things, but to hear someone else's approach, you know, the people in there's perspective was, I found fascinating. And to see them pivot that way, that quick, was uh, I think a good example of someone reutilizing re existing um, content, but adding in a new technology spin to it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, you're right. I mean, that's the director's commentary where you get to hear the, the director talk about what they were doing, what they were thinking, why they shot it that way, right? That's that's not uncommon, but we often miss um, the player's perspective mm -hmm. in the games, right? We don't, we, we're, we're hearing the perspective of maybe a coach, maybe, you know, um, a, a training coach or something. We're mostly hearing people watching the game saying, oh, look at that, that was amazing, right? We, we're missing that level of perspective of, what the player was feeling, you know, how, how that, you know, moment erupted for them. And so this is opening up a, a, a great new, I think, repurpose of, you know, I guess a great new avenue to repurpose that content um, to get it out there. I would say, you know, you look at, um, you know, some of the ones that are just doing interviews right now, NFL is pulling tons of interviews and pulling in players and, you know, building up their own commentary line. You got the, the ESPN documentary that just dropped about the, you know, the Bulls, um, you know, greatest season ever. And so, I mean, yeah, there is this opportunity to bring out content to revisit the past, but revisit it from a perspective that we didn't hear before. Um, and that's, that's, 
that's true filmmaking in the end, right? That's really what it's about, you know, documentary filmmaking. Um, the other one, I, you know, esports is alive and kicking right now. I mean, it's always been a great one for them because they've never, I mean, it's, yes, they have their big tournaments, but a majority of their gamers are at a distance, right? A lot of the tournaments are about different arenas competing together. And so they, you know, there's some, some great stories popping up about how the different esports games like Riot and Le uh, with their League of Legends and Overwatch League are transferring themselves into these remote operations where they're, you know, there are a couple video streams from each player that can come into a central, um, you know, repository or, uh, you know, an MCR, so to speak, and then they can repurpose that content and create, you know, great live content. And most of their viewers are online anyway. They're not sort of, you know, they're not your traditional broadcast feeds that are going to ESPN. These are all Twitch and, um, you know, uh, the, the Microsoft platforms for live game streaming like YouTube. So it's interesting to see them yeah. kind of repurpose on the fly. Yeah, that's interesting you say that. I mean, my, my kids, they're they're not missing a fresh YouTube content, right? Yeah. <laughs> the YouTubers are still keeping it fresh. And uh, it seems like, you know, the the media world in general is becoming more niche like that, you know, with, with what you're talking about with Bruins. And but so what I mean, taking all this into consideration, like what what do you really think is here to stay? I know Nick, you said stuff is going to go back uh, from a workflow perspective, from an actual you know, office perspective. People are going to go back into the office. But from the workflow perspective, are, are there still going to be you know, these uh, commentaries you know, on sports like Ben is saying? You know, are, you still, are you going to get something new? Who knows? Maybe the NFL draft, people really like the uh, personal nature. Uh, Jerry Jones's 10,000 square foot basement and how much better it is than everyone's house. Um, do you, do you think you know things like that are here to stay from a, from an actual content perspective, or do you think we're going to go back to to the old world? Well, I think there's a level of production that's going to go back to the old world because it's better, it's glitzier, it's glam. You know, I mean, you look at American Idol; they're they're broadcasting from their houses right now. Singers are singing from their living rooms, you know, and then that's in the end, people want the drama and the intrigue of seeing them all on stage. They want those those big productions. They want the live interaction, the face-to-face -face interaction, the hugs when, you know, somebody wins. People enjoy that experience, right? They're going to want to go back to that. So we're going to see those top-level productions go back to that style. However, um, I, I think the the commentary type of productions, the we're repurposing of old content, the ability to bring people into the conversation without making them come to the studio. I think as people evolve their skill set at utilizing over the wire technologies, and that's been a lot of what we've been talking with with broadcasters about lately, is how do I take Zoom, you know, which is this is kind of a Zoom experience here, right? Some experience. You know, yeah, that's the experience that they're going to be able to use. Yeah, definitely. Ben, what, what do you think? So uh, I, I look at it from a little different angle. I think it's going to be cost analysis, right? Is it cost the company more to get to do things remotely? You know, what can they, are they saving money by doing it remotely? Um, and there's lots of things that go into it. You made the reference of hiring talent, remote talent, you know, that editor in Texas or an editor you know, the average salary for an editor in Nebraska is probably a good deal less than someone in LA, right? Just, you know, because of the economies. So, okay, you add in the cost of the remote capabilities, you know, does it work out? What's, what makes more sense? 
So it's, I think it's going to be a cost benefits analysis driven by um, uh, the business side of, the, of it. And the other piece, I think, because they always look, uh, from my experience, especially in studios and things, they want to pay the talent first. That's where they want to put most of the money is talent. Infrastructure is where they always say, okay, where can we save a few dollars here and there on infrastructure or things like that, right? So is it, can they attract more talent by doing things remote? Can they save money by doing things more remote? Can they gain more profitability by doing things? Um, and then the other aspect is what does a studio audience, whether it's sports or a late night show or something, does that bring a certain value by having all the people together to the event itself, right? That's one thing with sports. You know, they talk about the empty stadiums. They talk about playing, you know, with no fans. I don't think that would be well as, as well received on TV because you don't have – you know, the chance from the home crowd, you don't have that. Even with the TVs now, you feel like you're there, but the noise and the surround and all that, it's not, it's not the same. I mean, heck, even the Indianapolis Colts try to fake it by pumping in fake <laughs> crowd noise to make it sound better. You know, so it's, there's, there's something to that, you know, sounds of the crowd, you know, to give that live like experience to the viewer um, that I, I think they're going to have to include, you know, live studio audience, things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, lots it. Oh, go ahead, Nick. Well, as I said, there's there's always that joy, right? I mean, diehard fans love to be there with other diehard fans. Um, but you know, but I think it's interesting is if you look back about three or four years when Levi Stadium was first launching, one of the original goals there was to give a different fan experience where you could tap in to different camera feeds inside the the facility and almost direct your own show, right? And and. Yeah. That's something that I think will be quite interesting to see because we've we sort of changed the angles, the views, how we're producing remotely right now because we have less control of it. But we're also providing more content overall, right? And so, will there be a shift? I mean, I mean, look at the first wave of this is Quibi. Um, it's not necessarily taken the world by storm, but they've de defined their on-demand content in both a vertical platform and a horizontal platform. So traditional sixteen by nine, and then more of a four by three pillar look, so that as you rotate your phone, the goal is, oh, I can get a different perspective on the angle. And it'll be interesting to see as, as we start to change our production, as we take advantage of, you know, remote views like this, will something like that take hold? Where we go, okay, well, we don't have to do the traditional broadcast because we're not traditionally broadcasting on TVs. We're going to devices and laptops and places where we can change the shape of the video, change the experience, give multiple angles simultaneously. Will something like that take hold? And that that will be the interesting watch for me uh, is to see does, does how people produce their content change when their content's not always going to be on a traditional broadcast TV screen where you only get one angle at a time. Yeah, and how, how our consumer is going to consume it, right? Personalization yeah. and customization is kind of what you touched upon. We can have a whole episode just on that. Uh, but so, I mean, taking a look at these remote workflows, kind of everything going on, I mean, as, as we wrap up here, what what words of wisdom or what recommendations do both of you have from, a, let's say, a smaller studio, medium sized studio that is just starting looking into all this? So maybe we'll start with you, Ben, and then we'll close off with Nick. Sure. <clears throat> I would say uh, it, use this opportunity to test, embrace, try new technologies, you know, things that you have go out of your comfort zone a little bit because I think you have more latitude to try new things now for a business than you've ever had before. Um, a, between manufacturers and publishers willing to work with you uh, to try different things, but also I think the company's tolerance for trying things, taking swings now to make things better is there's a more uh, aptitude or appetite for that than ever before. So I would say explore new technologies, be creative, try new things, because, you know, if two or three of them hit out of 10 tries, you're doing pretty well. And it could work well for the long term for your business. Yeah. How about you, Nick? Where's yeah, I think experiment, 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 right? Now is the time to test that piece of software you didn't have before. You weren't ready to. I mean, there's, there isn't anything anymore from a software standpoint that isn't demoable. Right. Or from a, if even from a hardware standpoint, right, there's the ability to pull down a file, fire it up, try a new piece of technology and see what advantage or disadvantage it gives you in your production pipeline. And, you know, that's as I'm talking to especially a lot of the sports teams right now who are 
a bit on the slow side since they're not playing games there a lot of them are taking that advantage right now to try some new things pull down a new file try a new software app look at a different way of producing it it's a great time right now i mean you, you hear from you know, like master class and all these great online repositories are saying take this class for free well yeah that's that's exactly what we should be doing right now is taking every advantage we have to try it a different way and to test and see what works and doesn't work um, because you know you're never going to get an opportunity. Well, hopefully we never get an opportunity like this again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I don't think my wife could take it. <laughs> I don't yeah. think anyone could take it. Yeah, that's it's, true. That's it's true. Challenging times. So, any any closing statements? I mean, we're we're coming up to the end here. So maybe Ben, a uh, closing statement for everyone out there. Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, I think hopefully you've enjoyed this. We're going to be doing these more of these brews and bites, but if there's anything our organization can do for you, please, you know, we'd love to work with anyone out there, big or small. Um, we'd love the opportunity to talk to you about what we're doing for other companies and helping them through these times. And Nick, any, any closing statements from you? Yeah. I mean, you know, Ben said it best. It, now's the great time to pick up the phone call. Um, you know, and for us, it's, you know, what problem are you facing? What technology hurdle are you trying to get through? Let's, let's talk it through, whiteboard it virtually and, you know, and figure out a path to it. Um, I think this, again, this is a great time to jump in and try new approaches to old problems or new yeah, problems. Do. Yeah, and to qualify those statements for, for us, for Coringo, send an email to info at Coringo.com or go to Coringo.com, C-A-R-I-N-G-O. Nick, where do people go to learn more about JBNA? Uh, www.jbanda.com. That's J-B-A-N-D-A. <laughs> Good times. Uh, you can hit me at Nick on Tech on Twitter, on YouTube, any of those places, um, or N-I-C-K-S at jbanda is my personal email address. Fling me an email. I'd love to get into these conversations. All right. And with that, I just want to thank both of you. Definitely thank our viewers for, for joining us today and for those watching this on demand. So uh, uh, there's a, hey, Adrian, there's a question yeah. on the. Oh. Uh, you, you can ask it? questions. What? Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah let's, let's let's ask the question. So it's uh, now that we've become accustomed to using these new platforms to bring in signals to interviews. Do you think this will be the norm for networks? And will there be a balance between quality and important content? Kind of touched upon that, but do you want to do you want to answer that directly again, Nick? Yeah, no, this is a great one. Um, yes, to all of the above, there is going to be. So we're. It's interesting as I talk to a lot of um, broadcasters right now. They're saying we have to increase our quality. We want something better than Zoom. We want something slightly better than Skype. So what are those stair steps to getting there? And what's the? And it really, what it comes down to is because you cannot control the endpoints, right? I can't necessarily control the person I'm pulling into the conversation. I can only control one side of it. It's how do I get the best quality out of what that person has in front of them? And does it mean me sending a better camera to them? Um, you know, using a better software to conference them in. But yeah, there is definitely going to be that balance of right now we're trying, we're just, it's right now it's just getting a face on screen and and we're we're talking to more and more people every day that are saying okay now i want to increase the quality now i want to fix the audio now i want to get latency down now i want to get um packet protection with forward air correction so people are layering on piece by piece as they get comfortable with each of those layers to make it better um as they go but it is going to it's always been the norm. I would say this is nothing new. Broadcasters have been doing this for years. They have studios. There's companies like The Switch that create fiber networks all over the country to allow you to have really good communication. The internet is changing the ability to break the bonds of having to use the more expensive networks and just use any network. Use a 5G bonded cellular, use 4G, use you know whatever's available. So there are great technologies out there that allow us to use the existing networks. The number one thing that's coming out of this, and we mentioned this yesterday when we were first talking guys, is this has the, been the best network stress we've ever put on our internet. Yeah. To understand where the holes are, to understand where the problems are, to understand who doesn't have good internet in this country, who does, where do we need to beef up our infrastructure? If there's nothing that comes out of this, it's that we fix our internet around this country to give the ability. And it's also opening up the, the conversation of our home internet isn't as good as it could be. Our routers aren't as good. Our Wi-Fi hotspots aren't as good, right? So this is really telling us all that we've got to um, fix our infrastructure. And once we do that, we'll have better communications for all, right? Our, our The quality of our content will go up um, in these remote interviews by fixing the infrastructure. Yeah. Ben, do you have anything oh. to add? 
Uh, no, I think he nailed it. I think uh, someone else. Yeah, here's another one. Another one. Go ahead, Adrian. Okay. Do, do you guys have any thoughts on the workflow that uh, HPA tested at their annual retreat for production workflows? So were you at the summit, uh, Nick? I was not this year. You know, so, okay. um, I don't know what it was. I'll look into it and uh, drop your email to address to us and I'll, I'll address it on a, uh, on another broadcast. Yeah. I'll, yeah, definitely. I don't think any of us were at the summit this year, but yeah, just follow up with us info at Kringo.com or uh, just hit Nick up directly and, and we'll, we'll get back to you as, once okay. we have the example of the actual workflow. I'm going to call. I just copied the question. I'll, uh, yeah. Save it and see if we can answer it in another place yeah. as well. There's yep. so many of them out there. I mean, there's so many yeah. technologies. There's so many ways to do it. Um, and what it really comes down to, and Ben, you hit this one earlier, is budget, right? I got clients that have no budget. I have clients that have some budget. I have clients that have big budgets, right? And it's finding, it's having an access to a lot of different ways of pulling it off. Yep. Um, you know, and and now that there are some standards in the industry for this, right? WebRTC is a, a more open standard. SRT has become a pretty interesting standard. Things like FEC and ARQ, some of these additional pieces that have um, bled into these other standards. Um, NDI even, right, for your in-house production. Now that we're seeing more standards, this has become much easier because we're getting better interoperability. I can say that word three times fast later. Um, we're getting that um, between different manufacturers now where I can yeah. blend uh, this encoder with this decoder uh, because we're utilizing some better standards overall. Yeah, we've definitely seen that as well for on the storage side of the house, the S3 protocol that Amazon developed, for, which is a common for the cloud and a lot of different cloud providers, but also uh, solutions like ours are S3 compliant. Now, not all things, not all S3 compliance equals the same. So make sure you do to everyone. If you see S3, just make sure you do your testing because not everybody stays yeah. up to date because it is, you know, it's owned by Amazon. So they do make changes. And if you have to stay with it, not everybody does, but that's something on the storage side, you know, it's, it's easy within five minutes, we can plug into an existing workflow because of a, a standard, like you said, well, it's interesting you hit S3 because what's been fun is to see that um, start to show up in software areas where it didn't before, right? Yeah. Where we're starting to see S3 built into production layers where I can push directly to an S3 bucket from, you know, Premiere or other applications. So it's it's nice to see that, you know, while yes, it is owned by one company term, in terms of the, the spec, uh, it still has become ubiquitous enough that it's not really being driven wholly by them anymore. You know, right. it, it has become an industry... Uh, you know, a group of professionals saying this works, how do we make it better? How do we build it into more software layers and application layers? Um, you know, so it's good. Right. Well, if only Microsoft had done that and not done blob, <laughs> blob, blob, yeah. blob storage. All right. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions, at least they're not coming in. So thank you for the questions. And uh, I, I guess maybe round two of closing statements, anything different <laughs> to say this time around? No, I think we're good. Just everyone be safe, stay safe, practice your social distancing, wash your hands and all the other best practices for uh, staying healthy. I, uh, you know, we're all, uh, we're all in this together. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go the opposite, go outside, get sunshine and, <laughs> and let's bur let's, let's blow up the herd immunity. I think this is one that people really need to start driving into and understanding the herd immunity, uh, which is, uh, we, we do all need to do this together, but we, and when you start to look into the herd immunity, it's a valuable potential thing that will get us out of this sooner. Uh, check out Sweden. The, th you know, the, the reports that came out of Sweden this week are amazing. And yep. I think, you know, on one hand, we may have slowed ourselves down. We saved some lives, but you know, it's time to get back to work. Yeah. And what about you, Adrian? Anything to add as, as the Mr. Germaphobe on the call? No, I'd just like to say thanks. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to everyone out there. Thanks to both of you. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks to the general public. I know it's been uh, hard for everyone. Hopefully you got some value here. And I think you know how to reach us. We, we said the email addresses, but we'll say it one more time. Info at curigo.com. And Nick, go to say J J Banda again. Jbanda.com. J-B-A-N-D-A.com. All right, everyone. So thank you for your time. And that's it for now. So we'll see you on the next Bruising Bites. Thanks, Take everyone. Take care, gentlemen. Appreciate you having me. Bye-bye. Right,